Hello, my name is Delinquency D minus and. 同志们，朋友们，女士们，先生们，大家好。二零二二年。I fear for the fate of Taiwan. Today's anime takes place just northeast of there, in glorious Nippon, the land of God. The show we're looking at today is a 24-episode disaster of an adaptation, directed by Yoshiaki Kawajiri. The original work is an unfinished manga by legendary all-female group Clamp. Other works by these ladies include Cardcaptor Sakura and the Timeless. Unfortunately, unlike the other examples, this show is—it's terrible. The name? It's called X or X 1999, aka X TV. Not to be confused with X or X 1999, also known as X the movie, or even X Unmei no Sentaku, released in 2002 for the PS1. See, this is funny because the PS2 was actually released like two years earlier in the year 2000. So, just feels like a, a little bit of a missed opportunity. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, the problems I have with this show are that the setting is like nearly incoherent. The plot is stupid and also incoherent, and the characters are. Guess. Before we talk about those, though, let's get a quick synopsis going so you kind of know what to expect. Basically, it is a seven versus seven team deathmatch. The fated day is coming where the final battle will be fought, and the end of the world may follow. Sounds super basic, but this is actually how they talk in the show. It's wild. I've been getting all sorts of special training up on the mountain, and now the day to use those skills is coming. In other words, the end of the world, the promised day. On one side are the dragons of heaven, who protect the seven seals that also may be made of or or by dragons. These guys are also called the seven seals, like they're called the seven seals, but also the seven dragons of heaven. And there are dragons. There's a lot of dragon imagery. It it's unclear. I. I'm not sure. Regardless, the seven dragons of heaven exist to protect humanity, and the seals placed across the world that stop the earth from unleashing environmental holocaust upon itself. The seven dragons of heaven are a group of six super magically gifted people who are led by the seventh member of the group. The seventh member of the group is Kamui, the one and only Kamui who will wield the divine sword Shinken in the final battle. Against the seven dragons of heaven are the seven dragons of earth. What's confusing is that the dragons of Earth are also maybe known as the Seven Angels, not the dragons of Heaven. The dragons of Heaven are the Seven Seals. The dragons of Earth are the Angels. The Seven Dragons of Earth are six super magically gifted people who are led by the seventh member of the group. The seventh member of the group is Other Kamui, the one and only Other Kamui who will wield the Divine Sword Shinken in the final battle. So, in short, good guy plus six versus bad guy plus six, and it's the end of the world. And they have swords. As I alluded to earlier, the setting is basically just like the rest of the show. It's incoherent. By the way, once again, it's still Japan. It has to be Japan in this case because of all the magic seals placed across the world, the strongest ones are all, of course, in Japan. They've got robots, clone people, Bible shit, and there are dragons. Maybe the characters also have different degrees of elemental, psychokinetic, future reading, and illusion powers that they use with little to no explanation. I'd like to call back to the synopsis at this point and go over some of what we've learned so far. We've got seven dragons of heaven, seven seals, seven dragons of earth, seven angels, divine sword Shinken, Kamui, Jibu! fated day, final battle, terms and conditions. You'll hear set pieces talked about and talked about and talked about and talked about. But there's like there's little to no explanation to any of them. The plot doesn't even get partially laid out until like episode five, and the actual death match doesn't start until like episode eleven, which is it's crazy to me. Now, originally the script for this video was 20 pages, with the argument for the setting taking up about four. But for the sake of brevity, I'm going to use one example from the several I initially had from that script. My example here is the barrier field, a key element of the show that is given this beautiful scene as an explanation. Sheesh, this is getting weird. Heck, it's downright freaky. I was just getting set to walk up to Kamui and start up a conversation, but some guy in a school uniform gets there. They jump onto the roof and fly off together. Then suddenly there's this chick who makes a sword grow out of her hand. Then a guy shooting hoop shows up and hangs out with him. I never even had a chance to say hi to the guy. <sighs> so what do I do now? Hmm? 
Hey, buddy! What the heck are you doing up there? Hey, don't mind me. I'm just out taking a little walk, enjoying the night air. Ah, a walk, huh? Most people don't take walks up a 50-foot tree. That's a shame. The stars are a whole lot prettier from up here. <laughs> You're funny, dude! <laughs> <laughs> and you came here to see Kamui, didn't you? And if I did, what are you gonna do about it? Are you a friend of that guy in a school uniform? No. Why? At any rate, you'll have to wait until my business with him is done. So this is a barrier field. It's the first time I've seen one. A perfect square, at least a kilometer on each side, enclosing an alternate dimension. Amazing. <laughs> the barrier prevents innocent people from getting hurt. No one's got to worry about getting clobbered except me and you. And this way, we don't have to worry about damage to the actual material plane. With no interruptions. We can fight all we want. You got that right, pal. Anything that's damaged or destroyed within the barrier will remain untouched in its original dimension. But as I understand it, if the person who creates the field is badly injured or killed, the rules change. And the original dimension will be damaged, too. You sure know an awful lot about it. Nah, just what I've heard. You want to give it a try? I hope so, because the only way you're getting out of here is by taking me out. Looks that way. As I thought. It looks like we both got something to do with this end of the world thing. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? So do you go? Very, very comprehensive scene that just gets better each time I watch it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> It makes things needlessly confusing. What makes it even worse is that what was explained was drowned in words. The world around them outside of the game is also underexplained. Humanity is supposed to be ruining the world. There is... There, there's, there's no... There's fucking like... There's one character who kind of mentions it on the side, and he's a bad guy. There's no like environmental terrorism going on. There's no evil election happening. There's no capitalism mentioned at all. They just expect you to believe that humanity bad. That's it. In addition to that, the lore that brought this thing about is, who knows? The backstory to the death battles is straight up just left to being prophecies and shit. What I'm trying to say, if you haven't understood it up to this point, is that the setting kind of sucks. Like the plot and the characters, which we're going to speak of in tandem. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Just as with many other not so great shows, this one starts with a billion character introductions in the first eight minutes. To sum up these character introductions, here are the aforementioned Dragons of Heaven that are shown. We've got Sarata Arisugawa, from here on known as Electric Guy. Arashi Kishu, we're gonna call her Sword. Dog User, that's the only name this character deserves. Subaru, Karen. And Seichiro Aoki, the Salary Man. All these guys are given a sign from either a mentor or a character that is named Princess Hinoto who was also introduced within the first eight minutes. The sign they're given is a message that the promised day is coming when the final battle will be fought and that the end of the world may follow. I've introduced all these people, but we're really not after them right now. Right now we want to talk about Kamui. Kamui. The Kamui, the main character. Yes, the one and only Kamui who will wield the divine sword Shinken. Play his intro. The dragons of heaven are beginning to gather in Tokyo. The seven seals, the seven stars of heaven. And the one that emits a light stronger than all the others. Kamui. Everything is shifting, moving. It has finally begun. Great scene, right? Any idea what's going on? 
Good. That's exactly how I felt. To save you a few IQ points, though, what I'm going to do is explain the character in an organized and mostly reasonable manner. As a child, Kamui's mother told him to retrieve the divine sword Shinken. She then died in a fire, and the child was taken away. Kamui gets older and returns to Tokyo in order to fulfill her wish. When Kamui returns, he attends an unnamed high school with his childhood friends, the siblings Fuma and Katori Mino. They were neighbors as kids, and hung out before Kamui was taken away and gained his powers. One day, Kamui and Katori climbed a tree together. This this giant, this fucking huge tree, two elementary schools, but all the way to the top. And when they got to the top, Kotori almost fell, and Kamui held on to her for like six hours straight. It was so difficult that he fell unconscious about halfway through. When they were saved, Fuma pledged to always protect Kamui. The sibling's mother also died, but she died giving birth to a sword. Here's the scene. I refuse to explain further. Not too long after this event is when Kamui's mom dies, and then he's taken away and he's raised somewhere else. What's weird is that when he returns, despite all of this history, Kamui sees his best friend for the first time in like six years and just ignores him entirely. Kotori later comes to see Kamui personally. He tells her to fuck off. It's been quite a while since we've seen each other. I want nothing to do with you, get it? Uh. Kamui's edgy, but it's it's just a ruse. Long story short, the reason for this is because he doesn't want to involve them in the final fated battle. Kamui also plans carefully. It's not revealed to us, but Kamui understands what the sword is and why he must retrieve it from his best friend's dad. Is that you, Kamui? I've come for the divine sword. Everything I said is also just a ruse. The first, like, five episodes are just him telling people they're dumb, and bitching that he can't beat up some old dude and take the sword from him. Like, I'm not kidding. This guy dicks around for about five episodes, and the only thing that everybody around him does is tell him that he is THE Kamui, and he doesn't know what he can really be capable of doing for the, the planet, the world. It's kinda hard to believe you're the real Kamui. <laughs> How confusing. This also includes his aunt, who legitimately picks him up to say he was special, and that his mom died as, uh, like a, a, I don't know, a protection so that he wouldn't be killed by evil or something, which has no bearing for the rest of the show like, at all, so it, I don't get it. He also apparently has no idea about this final fated battle, even though, like, everybody else seems to just understand it completely. And I can't stress this enough, they all come up to him and they tell him that he is the guy. Some time ago, when I felt it was important to know what Kamui looked like, I used the vision spell to find out. However, as soon as I saw him, I realized that he had sensed the presence of my spell. Oh, what do you expect? He's Kamui. <laughs> so you managed to survive, huh? <laughs> I'll be on my way then. Lady Adashi, until Kamui awakens, I'd like to ask one thing of you, if I may. Please continue to watch over that boy. I will, until he awakens, princess. The Seven Seals, and Lady Adashi, one of the seven. Please watch over him, and keep him from harm. Kamui holds the key to this world. Please, protect Kamui. What's even more amazing is how fast your wounds have healed. After that fight, you had at least two broken ribs, but by the time we found you, they were all better. Hey, that's no big deal when you're Kamui, right? For a guy I never met before, you're acting awfully familiar and I'd like to know why. Hey, I'm on your side, buddy. You don't have to worry. What are you? 
My sister Toru left home when I was still in junior high school, but before she left, she took me aside and said, I want you to know I'm carrying a certain person's child. This child will someday hold the key to what happens to the world. That child was you, Kamui. That is why my sister burned, taking upon herself all the misfortunes that would have otherwise befallen you in the future. Puma and Kotori, who also have no idea about the final battle, do their best to get Kamui to open up. Of note here are the following events, not necessarily in perfect order, but who cares at this point. Kotori loves, uh, I think it's lavender, and she can also see the future. Dad loses a mysterious encounter with a mysterious twink who steals the divine sword. Fuma practices at a basketball court under a bridge late at night because the big game is coming up. He can also enter a barrier field, which is something that only participants of the deathmatch should be able to do. Hmm. What's also weird is that the paraplegic dream-seeing fortune teller, Princess Hinoto, who acts as the handler for a good guys, has a dream about two Kamuis. There is Kamui, and then there is other Kamui. Her dream about the two Kamuis is in episode four, so continuing forward from that episode four, the premise still hasn't been explained. Episode five, though. I will show you about the earth, about the future, and Kamui. I will show you about yourself. Here in the city of Tokyo are the keys to supporting the survival of Earth. In this area there are many barriers created artificially by man. The Yamanote Line, a thread barrier drawn in the shape of Buddha's hand with the Imperial Palace in its center to protect Tokyo. The skyscrapers in Shinjuku which is a group of giant barrier stones and other foundations that support the unstable ground. There is great power within these barriers, which have come to be known as the Dragons of Heaven. And these are the Dragons of Earth. The powers that can obliterate these barriers and destroy the world. The ones who lead those powers are called the Seven Angels. And only the Seven Seals can stop them and protect the Dragons of Heaven. The battle between the Dragons of Heaven, the Seven Seals, and the Dragons of Earth, the Seven Angels. That is the battle for the end of the world. If the Dragons of Heaven are defeated by the Dragons of Earth, the world will be destroyed. This is the future that I saw. What also happens in this scene in episode 5 is that the fortune teller's sister, who acts as a handler for the bad guys, enters the dream where Kamui is being explained the premise. You cannot deny your mother's will, nor renounce your destiny. A destiny that is hidden within your name. Kami for God, E for authority. Kamui means he who represents the authority of God. The one to whom God has given the power to carry out his will and save this world. It also means he who hunts the authority of God. You mustn't go off on your own with Kamui like that, my dear sister Hinoto. And how devious of you not to tell him the crucial facts. And just who might you be? It's a pleasure to meet you, Kamui. My name's Kanoe. I am Hinoto's younger sister. I'm not a true dream seer, but I do have the ability to enter the dreams of others. So whatever my sister is dreaming about, I can see as well as she can. You must stay out of my dreams, Kanoe. You are not welcome here. What crucial facts? She told you about only one meaning of the name Kamui. It has another meaning as well. He who hunts the authority of God, meaning one who hunts down those who would use God's power and then destroys the world. So one possibility is that you'll choose to be a dragon of heaven, but there's an equal possibility that you'll choose to be a dragon of earth. What the hell do you mean? 
I'm saying that you have two futures, Kamui. She, she, yep, she can just enter other people's dreams. So basically, she has the future sight powers because she can enter her sister's dreams, and she does it all the time. Also, she hates her sister because her sister was treated better as a child because her sister has the future sight powers, and she, and she doesn't. So she's a loser. Kanoe tells Kamui that he might also be the leader of the six bad guys. This puts Kamui into a deep inner conflict as he has had no idea about any of this up until now. Kamui in his deep inner conflict uh, moves away from everybody and slowly tries to rekindle his friendships with Fuma and Kotori, who at this point are also spending every other single day and night in the hospital. But regardless of this, Fuma still manages to win the big game for his team even when he stayed up all night by Papa's side. Kamui watches this and is proud of his friend. Kotori is also proud of her brother, but then she has a dream of Fuma and Kamui fighting with swords. Strange. What's going on? What could it mean? If you haven't already guessed by the time code and the fact that the title has a part one in it, you're going to have to wait to find out, though. I'm going to release this one in two parts. Small spoiler. It does indeed get worse. Anyway, that's the video. Later. Later.